Hello, friends, and welcome back to Stories About Entitled People. Today, we have four stories for you, starting with a warm-up petty revenge story. But before we begin, don't forget to subscribe to our channel if you're new here and turn on notifications so you don't miss a new video every single day. Here we go. Steal my purse, I'll leave you stranded. So a little backstory, I'm from London, so we have an Oyster card that we use on public transport. You top it up and tap it when you get on the bus or train. With the newer ones, you can put it on an app to top up and you can see the last journey on that card. To the story. I was coming home from work and left my purse on the bus. Stupid, I know. So I froze my card and waited till the next day to call in at the bus station as the office was shut at this time. I called in the next day and no purse was handed in. F. Oh well, I thought. I reported it to the police and thought that it was that. Then I get a notification that someone had used my oyster to go into town. It wasn't a short trip either. It's an hour long journey they took. I told my roommate what happened. Being the devious little mofo she is, she said, did they top it up? I replied, yes. She smirked and then said, let's take the money they just put on it and strand them where they are. So she sat us down and canceled the card and took back the five pounds they topped up on it. So the card will no longer work. They're now stranded an hour away from home. Revenge is best served petty. And our second story. Insult me and rip me off? It'll cost you in the long run. A couple of decades ago, mid 80s, I had occasion to need body work done on my car. Kid in the lane to my right had to turn left without looking, and I took it into a large and supposedly well-regarded body shop for repairs. In hindsight, I should have known it wouldn't turn out well when they refused to give me a quote without seeing my insurance estimate first. To keep this short, suffice to say that they screwed it up. Charged for undercoating that wasn't applied, got cheap non-OEM replacement parts, ignored instructions to replace the fender, was okayed by the insurance company, and slathered a couple of pounds of Bondo on it instead, doing a miserable job of matching the contours and a myriad of other screw-ups. Within a week of getting the car back from them, I'd returned with a long list of problems, quality complaints, and omissions. The general manager, found later he was the owner's nephew and had a rep for being an a-hole, basically blew me off with a combination of indifference and rudeness. As to the quality complaints, he said, look, this car isn't worth putting Cadillac-level work into it. You want it done better? You'll have to pay us more money. I then did what most PO'd customers do, badmouth the company to anyone who would listen. Anytime I saw any car in need of body work, I'd warn the owner against this body shop, making my case by showing them the poor work done on my car. I continued doing this for at least four years until I finally sold the car. The real revenge part was that about every four to six months, I'd call the shop and ask to speak to the GM. When I got him on the phone, I'd identify myself as a PO'd former customer and tell him that I'd saved a dozen or so people from his company's shoddy work and I'd probably cost his shop about $10,000 or thereabouts. The first two calls he blew off. By the fourth, he was getting worried and wanted my name and for me to come in so that we could come to an agreement and get you satisfied. I told him he had already blown his one chance to make good by insulting me when I came back to get them to do their job right. As to my name, I told him he could easily find it by going over his list of customers who'd come back with complaints about the work they'd done. I continued the calls even after I'd sold the car for about six years or so. Towards the end of that time, I'd point out to him that his attitude had potentially cost his company over $100,000 worth of work. On my last call, I actually got the owner, the nephew was on vacation, and spent a good 15 minutes on the phone with him explaining why I'd made it a six-year mission to cost them as much business as I possibly could, and that his jerk of a GM had blown any chance of ever getting me to quit badmouthing them. I later heard from friends at a wrecking yard in the same town that this body shop had a new GM. While it may be revenge, you did what everyone should. If the company sucks, spread the word. On top of that, you made sure that they realized they did awful work and that that's unacceptable. And our third story. Frequent shopper demands employee discount. This is a story my mother shared with me. While working at a large retail store, several of her co-workers complained of a woman who found damaged items at every visit and demanded a discount. She came in frequently and the employees dreaded working with her because they knew she would pressure them into lowering the price of whatever she wanted. When my mom heard about this, she planned to deal with this customer herself so that no one else would ever have to again. 
When the woman came in, the workers pointed her out and mother went over to help her. At the time, the CB, choosing beggar, insisted that she was just looking around, so my mom went back to her other work. A few minutes later, CB approached my mother with a broken necklace and demanded a discounted price. Mom, taking the necklace, I'm sorry, but we have others that are not broken, and I can sell you one of those. Oh no, I want this one at a discount. Well then, let me fix it for you and I can sell it to you. Oh no, no, you need to give me this one at a discount. I'm sorry, I won't be able to do that today. Would you like to look around for something else? She walked away in a huff. Five minutes later, CB approaches the counter with a sweater and, pulling apart the seams as hard as she could, states that there is a hole and will need a discount. My mom knows that this is the last sweater of this kind and says, You know, looking at this closely, you can see there's nothing wrong with it. No, it's a hole. You have to give me a discount. I'm sorry, but there's nothing wrong with this sweater. I can't discount it. I can't wear it with a big hole in the armpit. There's no hole there. It's simply where the pieces are joined. Then you must give me your employee discount. The following is my mom's very thought-out response. Absolutely not! Everyone in the store went dead still. CB was surprised and a little embarrassed. Oh, now, now, don't stress about it. I could lose my job using my discount for this. I could be fired! Oh, okay, I was just kidding. Do you want the sweater at the regular price or not? Uh, okay. This woman never asked my mother for a discount ever again. Having your boundaries set in stone is the best way to prevent entitled people from running over your life. Good. Firm no is the best medicine, because every time someone waffles and gives in, entitled behavior is being strengthened. And our last story. Refuse to pay? Have fun sorting out your walls, getting sick and losing everything. Happened many years ago when I was 14 or 15. My dad has been in the construction business all his life, and we were doing well at that time. So dad gets a call from a friend of a friend, we'll call him Giant Douche, GD, to go and give a quote on a really large job building a school in the middle of nowhere. I'm from South Africa, and this school was in a very remote part of Drakensburg in the province of KwaZulu-Natal, not far from the little town we lived in. So my dad and brother are super excited as this could lead to more of these types of tenders coming their way, and GD, who called them, has been getting a lot of these contracts and subbing them out. So dad and brother go into this job with meaning. Halfway through, the BS starts. GD asks them to put their own capital down because his money is supposedly tied up in other projects he has. While my dad is great at his trade, he's not that great at business. And instead of seeing the red flags and listening to my mom to down tools, he proceeds to use hundreds of thousands of our own capital to finish the job, even loaning against our own home. Time to pay comes around and it's one BS story after another. Eventually, the realization kicks in that we've been screwed. We have to close the business, sell vehicles, and one of our houses, and this GD has essentially ruined us. We won't be getting our money back. Taking this guy to court is pointless because of the costs involved and the fact that my father willingly used his own capital and there was no contract apart from a verbal agreement. Everyone is PO'd, especially my mother for obvious reasons. My dad and brother have to move to another province to find work, and things are really bad. So bad that my mother and I were eating only once a day up until I finished school. So bad that my parents still haven't recovered fully up to this day because work is so scarce in South Africa, and my dad was already quite old when it happened. The revenge. Normal revenge. The school had specific colors they wanted the buildings painted. White, royal blue, and burgundy, the colors of the school. We had some left, so one night, me and my brother stayed up late playing PC games, talking crap, and waiting for the right time to exact our revenge. At around 2 in the morning, we sneak out with the paint and go over to GD's mansion. Double-story, thatch roof place with these walls that were done up to look like they were built out of natural rock? We proceed to give his walls the Jackson Pollock treatment and promptly took our leave. We made sure to take the paint cans with us and dispose of the evidence. The next day, the crap hits the fan. Cops come knocking, saying that a case of vandalism has been opened, and GD claims it was us because the colors match the paint used to paint the school. Brother and I play dumb. Mom and Dad swear that both of us were in bed the entire night, as both of them supposedly checked on us. Nothing further comes of this, but GD knows it was us, and is PO'd. Pro Revenge A couple years later, there's rumor flying around that GD was hit with an investigation by SAR South African Revenue Service, South Africa's equivalent of the IRS, and they found he'd not paid a crapload of taxes for years. 
All of his tenders and contracts got suspended pending the outcome of the investigation. He becomes terribly ill as a result of all the stress and claims he has cancer to garner sympathy from our town's community, but by now everyone knows what he's about and shuns him. Investigation reveals he's not been paying taxes for more than five years, all of his assets get seized, and he loses everything. GD eventually moves away to another province. Last I heard, he was supposedly in some high care unit. I asked my mom about it, and she admits that she had spoken to a longtime friend in SARS and asked her to check into his finances. Mom never did get much for reporting him, enough to put down a good deposit for another house and buy a car, but the revenge was so sweet because he burned us so bad. I'll never understand why builders, this happens in the U.S. too, are willing to lay out so much of their own money on a handshake. Hey guys, thank you all for watching the video. I'll see you in the next one.